Chip this in which conference we will now be recorded. Great. <laughs> our goal today is to share our aging resources with you and build a partnership in which we become your trusted resource for information regarding the older adult population. At Age Guide, we empower older adults to live well with dignity and independence by providing a range of services that address their individual needs, such as meals, transportation, and caregiver supports. We also advocate for older adults, weighing in on policy making at all levels. We advocate to, effective, to affect policy change that supports aging at home and in the community with maximum health, independence, and well being. An area agency on aging is the first place to go to connect services to people with disabilities and those over 60. Our service area includes the eight collar counties of DuPage, Grundy, Kane, Kankakee. Kendall, Lake, McHenry, and Will Counties. There are nearly 700,000 persons 60 and older who reside in those eight communities, eight county communities. We fund local agencies to provide services directly to older adults, their caregivers and families. We also monitor the funded service providers performance and we advocate on behalf of the needs of older adults. As we discuss resources for older adults, it's important to start with some background on the Older Americans Act, as it is the foundation of the work we do today. This act, which was passed by Congress in 1965, created the National Aging Network. The intent of the Older Americans Act is to provide funding for services and supports that enable older adults to remain independent and engaged within their communities. It also provides funding to support caregivers. Most Older American Act programs are available for anyone 60 and older, regardless of income or assets. These programs target those seniors that are 75 years of age and older, minority, living alone, living in rural areas, and or have low income. The funding provided by the Older American Act for Services is a combination of federal and state funds but the funds only cover about 40 to 60% of the total cost for each program and service. So agencies that receive grants to provide these services must also secure local funding to supplement these programs. Part, okay, next slide please. Okay, area agencies on aging were created by Congress to implement the Older Americans Act and area agencies on aging entities coordinate a wide variety of services for persons age 60 and older. Age Guide is one of 655 area agencies on aging throughout the United States and one of 13 in Illinois. Most area agencies on aging are nonprofit and non-governmental, except for Chicago, theirs is the Chicago Department on Aging. Each area agency is independent with its own board and advisory council and area agencies on aging contract with local agencies to provide services. Agencies on aging are tasked with ensuring quality assurance that Older American Act monies are well spent. We also administer over $16 million in funding annually to over 20 community-based service providers in our eight county region. And we also coordinate those services to support our wor the work of keeping older adults independent, connected and aging well in their communities. Part of our planning process involves completing needs assessments throughout our region and analyzing key trends. We also use this information in our advocacy work. At this time, I would like to introduce Gretchen Knowlton, advocacy and planning specialist for the agency. She will tell you more about trends in aging. Thanks, Leslie. Let's set the stage for what we're going to be talking about today by looking at the trends in aging. As you know, we're seeing a demographic shift as people in Illinois live longer and healthier lives. And we'll look at those statistics in a moment. However, it's important to think about this demographic shift in terms of not only challenges, the strains on resources, healthcare, and social services, but also in terms of opportunities. 
On the one hand, a huge bump in the population of older adults means a shortage of caregivers and increased strain on resources for services as well as healthcare. It's true that our communities are increasingly dealing with the realities of people living longer who may face mobility barriers, dementia, and other health needs. On the other hand, at AgeGuide, we like to look at these demographic realities as an opportunity to create livable communities that are accessible to people of all ages, abilities, and economic levels, even young families and people with disabilities. Harnessing the wisdom and vast experience of the baby boomer generation can assist communities in finding creative solutions to ensure we can all thrive as we age. And we're committed to maximizing the momentum in our communities to create inventive solutions, like some of the things you'll be hearing about later in this presentation, such as intergenerational music and memory programs and technology to take on social isolation. As you can see, one of every eight Illinoisans are over age 60. That number will rise to one in five by 2030. We currently have nearly 700,000 older adults aged 60 and older, roughly 25% of the state's 60 and over population living in our eight county region. There's been a 49% increase in our region's 85 and up population over the past 15 years. As the percentage of the aging population grows, the percentage of people demanding multiple health services also grows. As a state, we need to prioritize improving care options, increasing healthcare providers, and strengthening the service delivery system to meet the day-to-day -day needs of the aging population. As more Americans live longer and healthier lives, we need to adjust our public systems to ensure access for older people. Area agencies on aging support home and community-based services that are accessible, consumer-focused, and supportive, regardless of income or assets. Everything we're sharing today about resources and services is driving our communities towards a new approach to aging services, one that revolves around home and community-based services um, because research shows that overwhelmingly people describe aging well as being an integral part of their community. So why this focus on community and home-based services? To put it simply, people prefer it. A recent AARP study shows that 90% of older adults want to remain in their own home. This poses an increased demand on these home and community-based services that we're going to be talking about today. And it makes great financial sense. As you can see here, a US Administration on Aging survey shows that every dollar in federal funding for the Older Americans Act services leverages an additional $3 in funding. This return on investment is one of the ways home and community-based providers are able to do so much with limited resources. Supporting people as they age in their homes and communities prevents unnecessary healthcare costs and impoverishment. It creates a strong workforce to care for its aging residents, and it prevents millions in personal assets lost through elder abuse and financial exploitation. These programs serve mostly people in the community, and it's estimated that they cost about a third less than serving them in institutions. At AgeGuide, we empower older adults to remain independent, connected, and to age well. We advance this mission by funding the core services you see here on the screen. Um, these services are available through the Older Americans Act and are needs-based, which means that there are no financial restrictions and they're open and available to people 60 and over and caregivers age 18 and older who are caring for an older adult or caring for someone with dementia of any age. When an older adult or their caregiver receives community-based services, their health and longevity is improved. The impact of our services is reflected by the number of lives touched by our service providers in each of the counties we serve. We have a handout that shows the number of clients served in each county by service category for your review, and we'll be sending that out along with this PowerPoint um, following the webinar. So watch for that in your inbox. 
To talk more about community-based services and supports, I would like to introduce my AgeGuide colleague, Megan Weilman, who is the Aging and Disabilities Resource Network Specialist, and she'll discuss access to these important services. Good morning, everyone. Um, so, as you can see on the slide, um, the far, first core service area uh, we're going to be talking about is community-based services and supports, and this includes a variety of different services. Um, so, the first set of services that you see on the uh, slide are what uh, we call access services. So, our agency has designated and funds an Aging and Disability Resource Network, or ADRN, access agency in each county to provide, again, all of these services listed on the slide. Um, so these ADRN access agencies really serve as kind of that gateway for older adults and their families, and really ultimately the general public to learn about the different services and um, programs and benefits that are available, how to access them, and then to actually connect them with these resources. And that would include the array of different long-term care options that are available as well. So these services really are designed to help older adults and families make informed decisions before a crisis occurs. But know that often these agencies are responding to older adults and families experiencing substantial needs um, in time. Um, so for example, um, if an older adult needs assistance with navigating the housing options in their area, because they're looking for more affordable housing to fit their budget, but they also need accessible housing because they have mobility issues. The access services provider can help them navigate housing options based on their specific needs and preferences. Or if they need assistance with applying for benefits, such as financial assistance with prescription drugs or food assistance like SNAP or food benefits, the provider can help determine if they're eligible and then we'll help them actually with those benefit applications and do the follow-up piece to make sure that they've gotten connected. Um, so on the next slide, um, we have some additional community-based services and supports which are gonna be offered by a variety of different providers. Um, so we have education and recreation programs. So these are services that are often provided at a senior center or other community site. Um, and they're really designed to promote socialization, reduce isolation, and foster the health and well-being of our older adults. Uh, we also fund legal assistance by um, Prairie State Legal Services in each of our eight counties. Um, so again, what they do is they provide no charge to older adults on those issues impacting health, adequate housing, which would include long-term care, um, safety and access to government benefits and other legal needs to meet their basic necessities. Um, and they actually have an older adult helpline, which is available Monday through um, Thursday that older adults can call specifically to get help with those different issues. Um, and that would be on that community-based resource guide that we handed out to you uh, via email. Um, and then finally, we have transportation services which includes helping older adults with scheduling and obtaining rides. Um, so just know that transportation programs in each of our counties works differently. Um, some of the providers contract with PACE for programs like Dial-A-Ride, and then some use volunteers to provide transportation services as well. Um, so next, I would like to share a story from one of our providers, which is DuPage County Community Services, which highlights the impact of some of these stories um, I'm sorry, these services and how often the requests they receive are complex and really do include multiple needs to address. Um, so DuPage County Community Services uh, received a call from one of the federal victim advocates through the U.S. Attorney's Office about a senior client that had fell victim to a large moving scam earlier in the year. The client had paid a moving company to move all of their belongings back to DuPage County, but the company was actually a scam and they demanded payments to get all of their belongings back. The senior client, of course, is on a fixed income, and they also have a grandchild with a disability living with them as well. So the victim advocate reached out to DuPage County Community Services to see if they could assist them, um, since they, again, had lost most of their belongings and was in need of assistance. So through the work of one of their senior information and assistance specialists, um, she was able to set up and coordinate many services for the senior client and her grandchild. First, she worked with a local furniture bank and arranged a visit to replace furniture. 
The senior client also has limited transportation, so she was set up with the senior transportation uh, grant uh, ride to get to and from the furniture bank um, and also worked with the local church who provided a moving truck and helper since the senior was unable to move the items. The INA specialist also provided vouchers for clothing and household items through two other agencies so the client and the grandchild could replace those lost items. They also completed a LIHEAP application for energy assistance for the household since the um, senior client was in danger of being disconnected from her electric bill. The senior client also needed assistance with Medicaid application for her grandchild since they had lost their coverage. The INA specialist also completed the application for the grandchild who was in need of life-sustaining medications, and she petitioned the local Department of Human Services office to expedite the application due to the immediate need to have the medical insurance reinstated. The application was um, able to be processed quickly and the coverage was granted to the grandchild. The senior client and the INA specialist have maintained a working relationship and the senior client has stated that they are very grateful for all of the assistance coordination that um, the INA specialist as well as DuPage County has been able to provide. And just know that this is just one example of the, you know, of the work that all of our various agencies do on behalf of our older adults and families. Thank you, Megan. Next, we have Colette Jordan, who coming to speak with us about the family caregiver services that are available through the Older Americans Act. And um, she is the specialist for caregiver services. Welcome. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Leslie. I appreciate uh, the warm introduction. And good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, I wanna start with a, a story about my my mom who lived with Alzheimer's disease. She lived alone in an independent senior living community for almost six years after my dad passed away. During that time, that was about almost 14 years ago, I was juggling a full-time job, caring for my three children, and running to mom's after work every day and weekends to check in, run errands, clean the apartment. My mom didn't uh, want anybody else in the home. We tried to uh, get her to use community care program services for the in-home services, but she wanted her daughter to take care of everything. So with, all, with everything that I was doing for my mom, I never identified as a caregiver. I, it, it was just my responsibility. I was doing what needed to be done. I was her daughter. It was my responsibility. And I say now, if I would have known then what I know now about services that were in place, uh, services that I could have accessed, I have no doubt that my mom and myself would have had a much better quality of life at that time. Um, unfortunately, we did have to uh, place her in a nursing facility where she lived about another six months um, then. But I'm telling you this because many constituents who reach out to you may not identify as a caregiver and you can help them. Yeah. So for the Family Caregiver Support Program, I wanna stress that for the purposes of this program, um, these are informal caregivers that we're serving, they're unpaid caregivers. So recent statistics show that approximately 44 million Americans provide 37 billion that's billion with a B of unpaid informal care each year. One in four households, 25%, takes on the role of providing care to an older family member or friend. And 85% of all long-term care services are provided by unpaid caregivers. If family caregivers had to be replaced by paid home care, the estimated cost would be 45 to $94 billion per year. So ensuring that caregivers have access to education and supports that they need is vitally important to their own health and the health of the person under their care. Without the caregivers to help, many older adults and people with disabilities would need to be placed in nursing facilities. The eligibility for this program is a little different than other Older Americans Act programs. It's helpful to think about this in three categories. Number one, Family members and informal caregivers, including friends and neighbors, providing unpaid care to persons 60 and older. These caregivers can be 18 years of age or older. Also, they don't have to live with the person that they're caring for. Uh, 
So you may have constituents that are long distance caregivers and only manage things like finances and setting up appointments and things like that. They're still caregivers. Number two, grandparents and other relatives that are 55 years or older who are the primary caregiver of a child 18 years or younger. The parents are either unwilling or unable to care for the child. And the recent opioid epidemic has had a lot to do with more grandparents landing in this position of caring for several children. Number three, that can be served any relative, a parent or a grandparent, 55 or older, caring for an adult with a disability. So it's new this in, in 2017 that the parents are now able to, to uh, be served under this, uh, under this program. Uh, now with this program, uh, the adult child must have a mental or physical impairment that substantially limits their ability to care for themselves. And uh, to, to, yeah, to care for themselves. So respite provides caregivers a much needed break. Uh, and respite can be provided in the home, adult day center, or short-term nursing facility stay. There's a cap of a hundred of a thousand dollars, but they can ask for a waiver if, if they need more. And gap filling is flexible funding that complements the care being provided for unforeseen expenses that are not covered by Medicare or Medicaid or any other means. Some examples of gap filling can be adaptive equipment, grab bars, raised toilet seats, electric lift chairs, incontinence products, transportation, or emergency rental assistance. There's a $500 cap on that per uh, fiscal year, but they can also request a waiver if they need if they need um, additional items. So we also offer legal assistance uh, under this program and that can cover like advanced planning, living wills, social security and Medicaid denials, landlord disputes or guardianship cases. Another part of this program is individual counseling for caregivers. This could be therapeutic counseling provided by a licensed clinician, or can, it can be focused on life coaching. And like for instance, helping the caregiver understand their new role and what to expect. For grandparents, it might be focused on parenting the second time around or understanding teenagers, for example. There's also training programs, education provided in group settings, uh, that cover a wide range of topics such as disease specific information to stress relief techniques in the evidence based stress busting for family caregivers of people with chronic illnesses or dementia. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about that in a little bit. And we can also provide support groups through, uh, through this program. Now I'd like to introduce you to Ginny Moore. She's a community planner, my colleague, and she's the nutrition specialist here at the at Age Guide. Thank you, Colette. Good morning. So both our home delivered meals and congregate dining meals truly nourish both the body and the soul. All meals that are served in these programs provide one third of the daily nutritional needs of an old adult. Homebound adults over the age of 60 who have been assessed as eligible by either the care coordination unit or their managed care organization are eligible to receive a home delivered meal. This meal will typically be uh, delivered midday it's a, and it is a hot meal. It's delivered by a friendly volunteer or a paid driver. Delivery personnel are able to note changes in an older adult's appearance and behavior that may need attention. Nutrition providers can then reach out to either the emergency contact or in some cases, emergency personnel as needed to assist this client. When that older adult who waits every single day by the front door for his or her meal isn't there, the delivery person knows that something is not right. And this is the very situation that we found in Kendall County last year with a, a lady that every day waited for her meal and to see the delivery person come to the door. Emergency personnel were summoned right away and we were able to get life-saving medical care for the woman. I hear stories like this several times a year of the difference that it makes that that delivery person is on that doorstep every single day. 
We know that inadequate nutrition and or limited social contact has both direct health consequences that can affect the healthcare system and our economy because they're costly. Home delivered meals help meet the nutritional needs of older adults, but can also reduce those feelings of social isolation. As Meals on Wheels America states, the cost of one year of home delivered meals equals the cost of one day in a hospital or 10 days in a long-term care facility. That's a huge return on investment. The evidence for home delivered meals continues to grow. Also with a recent study showing that overall home delivered meal recipients have lower medical spending. Additional home delivered meals funding that has been approved for FY20 will help eliminate or reduce current waiting list and increase the number of clients that we're able to serve. We are sincerely grateful for um, this additional funding and ask that all legislators continue to support uh, this generous funding. On a note closer to home, we ask that you encourage constituents looking to make a difference to consider volunteering to meals. And as for those older adults who are not homebound, community dining meals or congregate meals as they're called in the Older Americans Act are open to anyone age 60 and over and are held at senior centers, churches, township buildings, low-income senior housing buildings, and other community settings. And we're even lucky enough in some of our counties to have restaurants that will participate with us in these um, and host uh, community dining meals for us. These community dining events, just like home delivered meals, offer a way for older adults to receive a nutritious meal and socialize with others. A study published in January of 2019 found that congregate meal participants had greater socialization outcomes compared to similar non-participants. Attending a congregate meal not only provides a chance to have this meal and socialize, but it's also a great segue for older adults to learn about other Older Americans Act services, such as recreational offerings, uh, education programs, transportation options, caregiver supports, just like Colette talked about. And if needed, case management, counseling, and in some cases, adult protective services. As for health and wellness programs, kind of segues on from nutrition programs. We are lucky enough to have several evidence-based programs offered in our area. There's chronic disease self-management program. This is an intensive program developed at Stanford University. Here in Illinois, we refer to it as take charge of your health. It's a little easier to uh, communicate than the long uh, chronic disease self-management. Um, we know that at least 92% of older adults have at least one chronic condition. So this would be something like high blood pressure, uh, diabetes, any, condition that they need to manage on a day-to-day -day basis. And we also know that 77% of older adults have at least two chronic conditions. This is a six, chronic disease self-management is a six week program, meets once a week, designed to help older adults manage their chronic condition by communicating well with their healthcare providers and taking care of themselves. We also can offer a matter of balance. This again is an evidence-based program. This one was developed at Boston University. It is an eight-week program that teaches ad older adults how to have reduced fear of falling. It also has a light exercise component, which I must say most adults really do enjoy. We also, in some areas, can offer fit and strong. This is a little bit more intensive of an evidence-based exercise program developed at University of Illinois. And it is a very popular program for those that take it. All three of these programs I've just mentioned are group programs. So again, it, older adults are able to get out of the house and uh, get to know others. In all of these programs that I have taught, I've noticed several times that people leave there, as they say, with a new friend. So many, many benefits to these. We also have healthy ideas in our service area. And this is a program that helps older adults seek care for depression and anxiety. We know that one in four older adults struggles with depression and anxiety. This is a one-on-one -on -one program that is led by a care coordinator. So next, I'm going to turn it over to Glenda Love, a community planner who is our specialist in elder rights. 
Hi, good morning. The next um, Older Americans Act core service is Elder Rights. Um, this includes Adult Protective Services and Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program. Adult Protective Services, also known as APS, provides investigation, intervention, and follow-up services to older adults 60 and older and adults with disabilities 18 to 59 years old living in the community who are victims of alleged abuse, neglect, and exploitation. We have the Adult Protective Services 24-hour hotline number available in case you need to make a report on behalf of an older adult or an adult with disability. It's important to know that all reports made to APS are confidential. The reporter's name is never given to anyone without permission. Here at Age Guide, one of my roles is the Regional Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program Liaison. Mandated by the Federal Older Americans Act and Illinois Act on Aging, the Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program is a resident-directed advocacy program that protects and improves the quality of life for residents in a variety of long-term care settings. Ombudsman advocate, empower, provide information, investigate complaints and concerns, listen, and maintain confidentiality. The Ombudsman program services are for people 18 or over who are either a current resident, a prospective resident, or a former resident of a long-term care facility. Ombudsman can also assist friends and relatives of residents who live in a long-term care facility. Long-term care staff, I'm sorry, long-term care facility staff members and administrators with resident-related concerns can also be helped by Ombudsman and individuals and families who are considering long-term care facility placement as a long-term care option. There are 346 facilities in our region with a combined total of 32,337 32, beds. That is the capacity of the long-term care residents that the Ombudsman in the region can potentially provide services to. In 2019, the Ombudsman in our region made 3,264 facility visits to either consult with residents and or staff or to do a regular presence visit, which is required in order to conduct outreach at the facility and build rapport. Ombudsmans assist residents who experience violations of their rights, including abuse, neglect, poor care, isolation, and lack of choices and meaningful activities, dealing with everything from cold coffee to involuntary discharges. Ombudsman assists with the quality of life for residents in facilities. When residents move into facility, it, facilities, it becomes their home. And just like in our own homes, we are accustomed to things that make it feel comfortable. We eat the foods we like and that comfort us. Um, I'll share a story with you. There was a gentleman who had recently moved into a long-term care facility. He frequently requested a tortilla with his meal instead of the bread that was given with each meal at the facility. His request was denied. The facility refused because they felt it was an unnecessary cost and it was only one resident. The resident began to refuse meals. I believe the resident was homesick and was wanting um, was wanting the facility to, um, was really wanting something that was familiar. The ombudsman got involved and worked with the facility to accommodate the resident's request. The resident went back to eating meals expressed his appreciation of being heard, and it was discovered that more than one resident preferred tortillas with their meals. For more information, feel free to reach out to me after the presentation. I will now um, pass it back to Gretchen. Actually, it's Leslie here. I'm going to talk briefly to you uh, next about the Community Care Program, which is a program that's funded through the Illinois Department on Aging. And this program is different from our older American Act services in that recipients must meet need and asset gu guidelines for this to, to be eligible for this program. The in the community care program, the income based there's an income based sliding fee scale, and assets are limited to seventeen thousand five hundred dollars. The community care program assists with supportive services, which enable older adults to remain in the community. As you can see from this slide, these services include homemaker assistance, 
adult day services, emergency home response service, and automated medi medication dispensers. The Illinois De Department on Aging reports that in 2017, there were 74,702 participants in this program. It also is projecting a 40% growth in the community care program caseload over the next 10 years. The average monthly cost of this program is $880 per participant, which compared to the average monthly cost of the nursing homes today, which is estimated at about $8,000 per month, it is clear to see that remaining in the community is a more cost-effective option in addition to being where we all wanna live. Another program that is not included in the Older Americans Act core services, but is an important part of the work that we do at Age Guide is the Veterans Independence Program called VIP. This program is a veterans directed home and community based service program that serves eligible veterans of any age who are at risk of nursing home placement and it serves their family caregivers as well. VIP allows veterans to receive home and community based services that enable them to avoid institutionalization and continue to live in their homes and communities for as long as possible. We currently serve 68 veterans in Lake, DuPage, Cook, and McHenry counties through this program. You'll notice there's nothing really south of DuPage County. And the only reason we have one DuPage County resident is because he switched his services to Lovell. Um, and, and so the, v, the VA program through there. We are currently working with Heinz to see if at some point we can offer this program for the rest of our service area. But this will be a slow process, but please know that we are working on it. In fiscal 19, this program saved over $2 million and avoided long-term care costs. And that $2 million was just for the 38 to 60 participants who were in this program at any given time over the year. Illinois has the fourth largest VIP program in the country. Technically, this is a pilot program started only 10 years ago. This program helps veterans to stay in their homes as long as possible by offering flexible so solutions to their needs. Working with trained options counselors, veterans decide what mix of assistance and services work best for them and their family. Using an improved amount of Veterans Administration funding, they can hire and pay for their own help. The goal of this program is to be flexible and give veterans control of their own care and support. As I mentioned, the VIP program is a pilot program. And thanks to new Illinois state funding directed at reducing social isolation, I would like to invite Megan Weilman back to discuss some other new exciting pilot programs that we have going on throughout our region. Okay, thanks, Leslie. Um, so yeah, next um, in the presentation, we are going to talk about two statewide initiatives that um, actually our area agency and, and actually all of the area agencies are currently engaged in under the direction of the Illinois Department on Aging. Um, and then we'll also again talk about the special projects we're implementing as a result of the special funding that we generously receive from the General Assembly to meet the goals of these initiatives. Um, Please note, um, again, as I said, that all of the 13 area agencies in Illinois are required to participate in these two statewide initiatives we'll be discussing. Um, and many of the activities that each area agency is carrying out may be different depending on the needs of their um, individual service areas. Okay, so again, the first statewide initiative um, and set of special projects address social isolation among older adults. Um, so social isolation is, um, um, I'm sorry, defined as the lack of connection with other people, one's community, resources, and supports, which also accompanies feelings of loneliness. So, you know, again, this is not a new phenomenon, and I, you know, many of the services that our um, programs, um, you know, provide really have been meeting the needs of um, reducing social isolation. However, the research continues to come out that really is underscoring the negative impacts. 
um, that isolation has on health and well-being. And one study has actually linked the health risks of ongoing isolation with smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Um, so it's really important for us more than ever to um, address social isolation. Um, so the goals of this initiative are to increase awareness of the issue of isolation, develop more specific strategies to reduce isolation, and help people become more engaged in their communities. Um, so as I mentioned, um, the state budget for fiscal year 20 includes $1 million throughout the state um, to support activities that address social isolation. Um, so again, for our service area, one of our strategies is to pilot services that address isolation. And we will be going over each of these projects in a moment, but we do want to point out that some of these projects are new, like the education and technology program, and some are actually um, an expansion of existing services that were um, currently offered by our partners, like the friendly visiting and telephone reassurance, but they have shown positive outcomes on reducing social isolation. So we thought it was important to help them expand that those services in their areas. Um, so we'll start with friendly visiting. Um, this includes weekly social visits to homebound or um, isolated seniors by volunteers. Um, the visits are focused more on developing a friendship and a network of social support. So the volunteers and clients are matched based on um, stated interests by the friendly visiting provider. Um, so activities might include socializing, telling stories, reading, playing games, going out to eat, and more. Um, volunteers really are not supposed to provide home care tasks, but we find out that um, often sometimes they do choose the, to assist the participant with like minor tasks if they're comfortable, like picking up the mail or like watering a plant. Um, so that does happen. Um, so we are currently funding two agencies to do this. Uh, we have DuPage Senior Citizens Council in DuPage County as well as Senior Services Associates in King County, again, who have been providing the service but are now able to expand it in their uh, respective service areas. Um, we also have telephone reassurance, which are phone calls by volunteers to isolated older adults to provide um, friendship, a security check, and informal assistance. Um, so the goal really is to help increase uh, the older adults' independence and self-sufficiency. Um, so like friendly visiting, the volunteers and participants are matched based on interests. So volunteers will call participants at least two times a week, but it could be more um, if they choose to do so. Um, and we are currently funding two agencies, um, Catholic Charities, Diocese of Joliet in Kankakee County, and the Crisis Line of Will and Grundy County. Um, and it, the service is available in both counties. Um, and the Crisis Line has actually been providing um, something called reassurance or sunshine calls um, for over 42 years. So we we're really excited to um, partner with them in this program. Um, we also have a program called Meals Plus, and this is a partnership between Moms Meals, nutrition providers, and our ADRN access providers that will provide short-term delivery of Moms Meals um, along with telephone reassurance, and we're targeting older adults eligible for home delivered meals in Kane and McHenry County. So again, we're targeting a couple different groups of people. So short-term clients, so those that might be in need of immediate assistance due to a recent hospital discharge or temporary change in health status. For example, you know, perhaps you have an older adult who had hip surgery and needs meals on a temporary basis because they're unable to cook for themselves. Um, and then we also are targeting clients on um, home delivered meal waiting lists, as Jenny mentioned earlier. Um, so a client can be in this project between two weeks and eight weeks. Um, so by providing meals and connecting them with other services and resources, really um, the goal is to have to see some positive outcomes, including improving their physical health and well-being, reducing isolation and loneliness, and then of course reducing critical incidents like rehospitalizations, falls, et cetera. Um, so we actually, again, we're um, working with um, nutrition providers who are ordering and coordinating all of the meal delivery with Mom's Meals, which is a private meal delivery program. Um, our ADRN access provider, which is Senior Services Associates, is responsible for determining the eligibility of clients and the um, amount of time they will have these meals provided. Um, the great thing is they will actually be sending a case manager to the client's home on the day of meal delivery to assist that client with bringing the meals into the home and then completing all of the other required paperwork. 
Um, senior services associates will also coordinate the telephone reassurance calls for the client with that volunteer provided by their organization. And then that volunteer will be contacting that older adult um, at least twice a week for the duration of that program. Um, and again, then we're hoping that the uh, telephone reassurance volunteer will then encourage that client to engage in their community in other ways. Um, including being possibly being a telephone reassurance um, caller for another client entering the project. Um, and then of course, if the client um, continues to uh, need to receive home delivered meals beyond that eight week period, um, senior services and the nutrition provider will connect the client to regular um, home delivered meals if necessary. Then we have the education and technology program. Um, so this is a really cool new program between T-Mobile and the Morris Library in Grundy County. And what they're doing is they're providing tablets with a two-year paid data plan to socially isolated seniors who agree to attend computer classes provided by the library staff and volunteers. Um, so really the goal is so they can use that um, technology to um, interact and connect with their families, friends, and other community resources. Um, the library is also working with the Grundy County Housing Authority to provide the classroom-based education sessions at their senior residences. Um, and so the class sessions um, are including training on how to operate the tablet, how to set up and use email, downloading and accessing applications and social media sites. Um, and they're also teaching them how to use an app to connect to the library system. Um, and of course, then they also want to teach them how to use the tablet to safely browse the internet and engage in online banking, healthcare, shopping, et cetera. Um, and then the last um, two services listed here, uh, we're funding two special transportation grants in Will County um, through the American Association of Retired Asians, as well as Senior Services of Will County to expand the transportation service area in that service area. And then we're also actually expanding some community dining sites in Will County by fostering a partnership between uh, the American Association of Retired Asians and the Will County Community Services um, to provide um, a home, I'm sorry, a community dining um, ethnic um, meal to better meet the needs of these diverse populations. Um, so of course, you know, with all of this additional funding and doing these special projects, um, there are some requirements that are tied to these dollars. Um, you know, was we, of course, we want to gather data that will help our legislators see the positive results of this funding. And so we can hopefully continue to um, continue the funding subsequent years. Um, so all of our special project participants are receiving um, a welcome packet that it will include a state developed social isolation brochure and we'll make sure to send you a copy of that. Um, just again, to raise awareness on what social isolation is and how to better address that and what they can do to become more engaged in their communities. Um, and they're also, each participant will get additional information on all of the different local resources and services tailored to them, so we're better connecting them in their communities. Um, we're also encouraging participants who are able to, to get connected to social networking websites, as well as we have a really cool um, telephone-based programming program, sorry, telephone-based programming um, called Cobia Well Connected, where older adults can call a toll-free number or go online to participate in a variety of discussions and programs on wellness, education, music reviews, live performances, and more, and we'd be happy to share that information with you as well. Um, and then additionally, the department is requiring the use of a questionnaire called the UCLA Loneliness Scale. Uh, which will be administered to all of our program participants before and after participating in the project. So um, it really it's a three question um, survey that measures three dimensions of loneliness. And our goal is that, you know, by participating in these projects and getting more engaged and connected in their communities, we'll see some really positive outcomes, including a decrease in feelings of loneliness and isolation and um, an increase in their overall health and well-being. And again, the findings gathered uh, will be used for future budget justifications, to establish outcomes, and develop best practices. And before I hand the presentation back over to Colette, who will be discussing um, the next initiative, we do want to add that we're really excited to have this opportunity to be testing out new programs and service designs. So really, we can increase and enhance um, the offering of services available in our region to better meet the unique needs of older adults and caregivers in each county.
Hello again. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk to you about a, a second statewide initiative uh, that we're collaborating with our local aging network, funding service providers, and other community partners to address the needs of people with Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. Uh, so this program also assists caregivers in, in a variety of ways. So we received uh, general revenue funds to support these activities. One of the, uh, the things that we're doing with, under this uh, is a uh, gap filling. So gap filling, we are providing uh, funding region-wide of $125,000 we have to uh, do services through throughout our, our a county region and assist people with Alzheimer's disease and their caregivers. So uh, we have a cap on the funding for gap filling of $1,500 per person and 2,000 for home modifications. We've done things through other grants like ramps and stair lifts and things to, and anything to help keep the person uh, safe and improve the quality of life for both uh, both the person living with dementia and their caregiver. So um, it can help um, anything from home modifications, like you know I had said a ramp or a stair lift, to fidget quilts or therapy pets to help improve the quality of life. Again, or her Facebook portal so that the older adult can um, communicate with their family and friends at any time of day or night. Uh, so another program that we're doing uh, under this is a tailored caregiver assessment and referral program. And it's called T-Care, Tailored Caregiver Assessment and Referral. And T-Care is an evidence-based Administration on Community Living Accredited and CMS approved family caregiver support program that reduces family caregiver burnout and delays nursing home placement. The predictive technology saved Washington State Department of Social and Health Services $20 million per year during the pilot with 322 family caregivers. They estimate that it delays Medicaid uh, member nursing home admissions by 18 to 24 months. Uh, this case management protocol is a web-based tool, and it uses an algorithm to identify services and resources tailored to the caregiver. And they can add local, uh, the, each uh, provider can add local resources and services to this. Um, I did the training on this, and it's a really um, comprehensive program that we haven't had for caregivers before. Um, so I'm so excited that we're piloting it in Lake County and Will County, and hopefully we can uh, sustain the program in FY21. Um, so uh, we're researching and looking at different ways to get additional state funding for that uh, to continue. So uh, another program that I'm really excited about is uh, we're expanding the stress busting program for family caregivers of people with dementia um, or people with chronic illnesses uh, by offering 12 uh, $3,500 grants to our providers uh, throughout the region to host a nine-week session. So this stress busting program um, meets the administration on aging highest criteria for evidence-based programs and it has a proven track record of success in helping family caregivers manage their stress and cope better with their lives. The program consists of 90-minute 90, 90 sessions that occur once a week for nine weeks and it's conducted in a small group setting with two facilitators um, that, are, uh, that are trained or master trained. The participants get many resources throughout this nine week program, including a, a handbook covering class material, a meditation CD, and a relaxation strategies DVD. So uh, myself and a colleague uh, here at the agency, Elaine, we're master trained in this program in San Antonio, Texas, uh, under a different grant that we were um, that we were uh, funded by last year and a half, uh, called the ADSSP grant. And uh, we conducted a session first in North Chicago in Lake County. We had uh, seven caregivers in the class, and I'm, I'm telling you, by session nine, uh, one two of the people that uh, were in the class. One was a veteran uh, gentleman taking care of his wife who had frontotemporal dementia. 
he came to me after session nine and he was in tears and he asked if he could give me a hug. And, um, and I said, of course, and uh, then I started crying. And he told me that this program literally saved his life, that he wouldn't be there today without, without this program. And um, he made some strong bonds with some of the other members. And, um, and since that time, and that was in uh, early 2018, um, we've expanded this uh, program and I've done a facilitator training uh, in June of 2018 where we trained 14 other facilitators. And then this last August, uh, we trained, uh, Elaine and I trained another 18 facilitators. So this uh, uh, expansion throughout the region um, is going to be really great for the caregivers. We just need to help um, identify these caregivers. Like I said before, we don't always identify as a caregiver until it becomes overwhelming and the stress becomes so great that oftentimes the caregiver is hospitalized or even dies before the care receiver. So that's how um, passionate I am about this program that, to help these caregivers. The last program I'm going to talk to you about is another exciting um, program. I, I really have the fun programs. I love I, I love coming to work every day. And uh, this one is uh, the Evidence-Based Music and Memory at Home program. And this Music and Memory uh, helps reconnect individuals with their memories through the use of a personalized music playlist. And they're on pre-programmed headsets. Um, we're piloting this program as an intergenerational program uh, using um, high school music honor students. And uh, so there's two students per senior um, and they go out the first time um, and they interview the, the person living with dementia and then they go back to their um, schools and they upload the playlists from iTunes on a dedicated computer that we have for the program and then they return and deliver the music and I have to tell you uh, we started this program in Yorkville just last week um, at York Yorkville High School students and we uh, did the interviews at the Oswego Senior Center and we had seven elders uh, living with dementia from the Lighthouse program there and elsewhere in, um, came in Kendall County. And uh, I was able to observe this. It, it was just amazing. One of the women, uh, her name is Kathleen, um, she uh, she's, was interviewing with the students and started talking about um, music that she loved from growing up. and. Uh, she started humming and singing, and then she stood up and started clogging. It was like, um, it was just so so fun to watch. And, and at the end of the session, uh, we're using a consultant with this program, um, and the consultant uh, was chatting with Kathleen, and all of a sudden she started, he said, he said we're gonna get you your music, Kathleen. We'll be back in about two weeks and, and we'll get you your music. And she started singing and then she grabbed his arm and started dancing and swirling around uh, with Chip, uh, our consultant. So it was just fun to watch. There was not even any music playing and she was up and dancing. Um, so we get to, I get to go back next week, Wednesday and deliver this program uh, and, and get to see the results of what this personalized music um, that connects people to their memories does. Uh, so I'm excited to do that. And then we're doing the program in um, DuPage County next at uh, the River uh, Riverwalk Adult Day Center, Community Center, and using uh, Nequa Valley High School music students. And then uh, we'll be doing that in February. And then in the spring, we're moving on to Gail Borden Public Library in Kane County. And I'm not sure which high school that they're using, but I'm excited to partner with the Gail Borden Library uh, on, on that program. So uh, we're doing a lot of, a lot of uh, important things here related to dementia and, and their caregivers. And I'm, I'm so happy to be a part of that program. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Colette. As you can hear, there are a lot of exciting things going on in your districts. 
that um, we wanted you to know about because we feel very passionate about them and they're having a huge impact. I'm going to talk to you next about the census. This is Gretchen Knowlton again. So you can put a name with a voice. Um, I know you've heard a lot of buzz around the census. I know you are all working on this issue in your offices. Um, and the older adult population is one of the target populations um, that is um, under concern as being a hard to reach population. So the Illinois Department on Aging awarded funding to their 13 area agencies on aging, um, including us here at AgeGuide, to conduct targeted outreach and assist with motivating participation in the census. And we're preparing to collaborate with our local providers who work with older adults in the eight county region. We're in the process of creating a collaborative work plan to outline the outreach efforts in our region, including mobilizing our funded providers and partners from across the aging network. We'll also be reaching out to local businesses, other human service providers, health clinics, and faith-based groups and places of worship. Our census collaborative work plan also outlines how we'll integrate census messaging into existing services where we're already connecting with this hard to reach older adult population and where our service providers are the trusted advisors who can assist older adults in completing the census, such as our community dining and home delivered meals programs, our in-home services, senior and health fairs, et cetera. We plan to use volunteer census ambassadors at the congregate meal sites, as well as to distribute awareness materials and promote census messaging. To assist us with this mobilization, we've created tools and resources that you can utilize as well. Um, the following slides are some samples of what we're going to be sharing with our aging network and partners, and we welcome you to borrow these slides or any of our census handouts and messaging if you're doing any outreach on the census for your adults. So we'll be sharing more of these things with you after the webinar. Now, I know all of you on this call know the importance of the census, but this is the messaging that we are using in promoting census completion to older adults. So I wanted to share this with you. Um, most people understand that the census is tied to legislative representation, but they don't always understand all that the population count affects. We need to paint a clear picture of all the ramifications of the census and why it matters to them, especially these older adults. So the message that um, we're using is counting for dollars and that Illinois' overall population has been decreasing for the past century, mostly due to population loss in the central and southern part of the state due to outward migration, but it is going to affect all of us. Um, and since 1950, Illinois has lost one congressional representative in every census. This time, we stand to lose possibly as many as two congressional seats. What we want older adults to know is that just a 1% undercount in Illinois will be a loss of $1.2 billion over the course of the decade. This is the message that we're trying to get out to older adults. Here, um, we're sharing a sample of what the census form actually looks like so people know what to expect. This is a population where the visual of the form will be important. There's a lot of misinformation out there and we've taught seniors. We ourselves have gone out and encouraged seniors to be cautious about scammers and people who would take advantage of them. Um, so now we need to get the word out to clarify a few things related to the census process. First, um, some older adults may be reluctant to share information with census, um, so let them know that it is confidential. And second, there are always scammers out there, unfortunately, and the US Census is an opportunity for predators posing as census takers to gain access to financial and personal data. The seniors need to know that they'll never be asked for personal or financial information by the US Census. Also, the census will not be making phone calls or sending emails. The census will never ask for money or donations or credit card numbers. So as you're speaking to older adults out there, we would appreciate you helping us spread these messages. 
finally, there was discussion um, of adding a citizenship question to the census, and it's very important that older adults know they will not be asked this question on the census. We're going to be encouraging older adults to make a plan for completing the census. Telling people to make a plan helps make sure that they'll actually follow through. Um, there are three ways they can complete the census. And we need to clarify this because the push this year for online completion has created some confusion about whether people can still use the other methods um, of phone or mail. And the answer is yes, they can. Now that we've talked about the census and its potential impact on Illinois resources and legislative representation, let's take a look at some of the most pressing issues for older adults. Here are some of the key legislative issues um, for older adults and at the top of the list you see is reauthorization of the Older Americans Act, which was due for reauthorization this year. We're asking for bold investments in the Act's core funded aging services to keep up with the growth of the older adult population that we talked about earlier. We in the Aging Network are asking for two things. First, we want Congress to double the funding of the Act with the growing population investing in community-based services is a must and they need to be increased, not cut. And second, we wanna protect the consumer focus of the act, meaning to protect the role of the area agencies on aging in addressing local community needs. We're asking that Congress reject any cuts or any budget proposals that would cut critical services to seniors and caregivers. We're asking for support for Medicaid as well, which is critical to the health and well-being of older adults. We want investment in cost-effective domestic programs that keep older adults healthy and independent in their homes. And we support legislation that fosters innovation. We need to invest in research, evidence-based programs, and best practices to effectively service a growing population for years to come. Um, investing in keeping older adults healthy and independent must be a priority at all levels of government as America ages. Our, as our um, community's legislative aides, we need your help to continue to keep seniors in programs that effectively meet their needs and the needs of their caregivers at the forefront as you work on legislative policy. Now that we've shared how valuable the home and community-based services are, please help us remind legislators to protect these critical services and supports. Let us be a resource for you on state and local legislation that will positively impact the quality of life for seniors and people with disabilities and help save taxpayer dollars. Please make sure your legislator knows how the Older Americans Act helps his or her constituents, your community and federal taxpayers. If you need specific um, resources or any sort of data, please let us know. We are a resource and we are here to help. So that's how you can help older adults. And now here's what we can do for you. We have lots of tools and resources to help you keep up with the latest on what we're doing and what's important to older adults and their caregivers. I wanna encourage you to engage with us on social media. As soon as we end the webinar, if you're not already, please follow AgeGuide on Facebook and Twitter. There you'll find that we post lots of useful articles, resources, notices about events in the area, lots of useful information on our social media sites. Then there's our monthly newsletter called The Aging Report that's stuffed with timely articles. You can sign up for that by going to our website under News and Events, and you can sign up to get them sent to your inbox. These things are a great way for all of us to collaborate and advocate for older adults and to stay in touch. This concludes our resource presentation. We hope you found the information helpful and um, following this webinar, as we said, we'll be sending you some goodies like the PowerPoint and the promised census resources for getting the word out to older adult constituents on the census. And we'll be sending you that community level data on the service impact so you can see exactly what's going on in your specific districts. At this time, we'll take any questions that you might have. I'm going to unmute all of you. 
um, so that if you have a question, um, just make sure you're unmuted on your end, or you can also type your question into the chat box on your screen. So are there any questions at this time? I think we no, we don't have you unmuted yet. Hold on just one second, please. There you go. So I, I have a question. I'm um, this is Sharon from Representative Tom Weber's office. You know, the biggest problem I have is um, knowing where to go. To, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So the biggest problem I have is, is knowing when where to go um, as far as an immediate help. So I, you know. I'll have somebody come in and I have to go to five different places to try and figure out where to send them. Is there a central person I can send someone to that would allow me to get them the help they need? Um, thank you for your question. Um, I would suggest that you go to your, um, in, to your um, ADRN, which is the um, access agency. And you know, if we sent you in a handout, our community resource guide, and that that access service agency, which is is also included. So if you look at information and assistance on those community resource guides that were sent in that email, they will tell you who is the who what what community organization does the information and referral work in your county. That is really the best person to go to because they will talk to your constituent about what they're. What, what kind of help that they need. And also based on the conversation, be able to give them more of a 360 view of different services they also would qualify for, or they might not even realize that they need. Is that helpful? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Okay, Thanks. great. We did have a question in the chat about the census materials, um, the, especially the tips about there won't be any phone calls or emails coming from the census. And do we have a graphic that we could share on social media? I think that's a great idea. And I think we will be creating more tools and messaging templates for you to use. And we will certainly share that with you. In addition, I would tell you that um, the age options, which is also an area agency on aging, is going to be the resource for all of the area agencies on aging and making sure that we're following all the um, expectations of the Illinois Department on Aging and getting this information on the census out to our older adults and our partners. So they will have resources for us and we will be passing all of their resources plus the ones we develop out to all of our community partners with um, website links and, and various um, pieces of information that you that you can use. So uh, we have your emails now and we'll be sure to pass that, add you to our list of, of um, different community partners that we'll send this out to. Are there any other questions? Well, if there isn't any more questions, one other thing that we forgot to mention as I'm sitting here, um, the next, in, in 2020, uh, 20, we'll be having our advocacy breakfast collaboratives again this year. For those of you who are familiar last year, we we really, these are legislative sessions that we have where we invite um, older adults to come, our legislators and community partners to all come together and talk about the issues related to older adults. And also to, to just get a conversation going, a candid conversation about what the older adults in our communities would like to see and how these services are being provided and how to access resources. So it's a great time to get together. And of course, we, we centered it around breakfast because we felt we'd have better of attendance if we fed people. So um, be looking for an email to come from the Agency on Aging, letting you know the date in which we'll be doing the uh, advocacy breakfast collaborative in your area. We're, we usually combine counties. So in the past, we've done McHenry and Lake together and so on. So we'll be sending information. We have dates and we looked at the schedule for the con uh, for Congress and what everybody has going on in the House of Representatives and when they're opened and closed and when they're back home. And we hope to pick dates or we, we've looked at picking dates when we feel like the, we have a better chance of our representatives being home in the communities. 
So hopefully that'll make it easier for people to come and attend our events. So that'll be coming to you shortly. Any questions on that? Okay, if there's no other questions, then I wanna thank you again for, for joining us on this call today. And I look forward to working with you throughout the years. Thanks again, bye. Thank you. Thank you.